Welcome to another episode of How I Discovered My Gift with yours truly. I'm honored and delighted to have our guest on today. Let me just read a little bit about her bio for y'all. <clears throat> Natalie Noisette, New York native, has transformed the way we approach our business finances. As a game-changing financial executive, Natalie is widely respected for achieving strategic and service excellence in evolving markets, competitive industries as well. Natalie's experience as a multi-industry expert has allowed her to drive unprecedented revenue and 2x profitability gains in numerous fast-paced startup environments. That's not easy to do. By galvanizing immediate wins and transcending cultural divides, Natalie has become a reputed C-level influencer and business strategy accelerator with a unique vision to make companies efficient to surpass their targeted goals. Natalie has cheerfully delivered inspirational financial leadership for SMEs while expertly guiding them through revenue building strategies and cost saving initiatives to accomplish explosive business growth. Welcome to the show, Natalie. Truly an honor to have you on. Thank you. Thank you for having me, David. Yes. So this is going to be lightning, right? We're going to jump right into it. Okay. Give us the breakdown. Give us the journey, the story, where it starts, how things stem. Um, the journey really started by having a problem that I end up fixing for myself. And then a bunch of people started asking me about it. I realized it was consuming a lot of my time. And in order to make up for it, I had to charge for it. And that became a side hustle that ultimately led me to retiring at 28. Wow. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. You got to dig in. We got to dig in on that. Right. So what is this problem? Mm -hmm. What is the side hustle? I've so, never heard anybody retire at 28. That's amazing. Well, retire from corporate. Let me just say that. Okay. 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 I left corporate and started working for myself at 28. Um, gotcha. The problem was I had really bad credit. Um, I went to go qualify for a car and I was denied. And that was the first time I'd ever come into contact with my credit report. And from that time forward, I realized that um, a lot of my friends or like peers at that time or in that age group were asking questions about, you know, how did you get a car? Like, how did you do this? Or what are you doing? Like, how do you have an Amex at 21? Like those kind of questions. Um, and that was mostly a function of just having learned about where I had messed up. And then solving that problem for other people, other friends. So they would ask me, like, how do you do this? How do you do that? And I would spend hours on the phone every day. And then one friend would refer me to their aunt. And then their aunt would refer me to their friend. And then it came, it became a situation where, like, my phone, would, I'd be at work. My phone is blowing up. Text mm -hmm. message calls. And I'm like, yeah, this is not sustainable. Um, at first, I got a lot of pushback charging people because, you know, you're their friend. So that's kind of like the expectation. There's a little bit of entitlement there. Um, but then I started telling people like, hey, I'm going to charge for this. Don't tell them I did this for you for free. I'm going to charge the other person. I'm doing this for you for free. But every person moving forward is going to be charged. And then um, I my prices were really low, which which met with which was met with no resistance whatsoever. Um, and then once I understood the value of what I was doing and I charged more and I understood what my time was worth, I was able to kind of like balance that out. And then I left my corporate job. Wow. wow. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. So take us into what it is that you do. How do you solve their problem? Right. So the credit. I've since moved from credit. I, I really don't help with the credit anymore. I wrote a book pretty much outlining point A to Z of what it is that I do through the entire process for someone else. Um, and then it's, it's beneficial because if you're trying to, if you're trying to start a credit repair business, you can actually really do it that way. Minus like the, um, like the bonds and like all the other business bureaucracy that goes into owning a business. But even if you wanted to just do it for yourself, it's more cost effective. The real trade-off is the time that it will take you to read the book. But I don't do it anymore because there was a new demand. <laughs> the new demand now is um, I actually restructured my credit company um, to meet the new demand that happened at the head of the pandemic. Um, I noticed that like around March, 
March, April, May, June, July. Around like April to June, a lot more people because of the pandemic were asking me like, Natalie, I lost my job. You know, I don't know what to do. Like, you know, how did you do this? How did you do that? And it ended up a situation where um, I end up consulting more on the business front because by that time I had been, I was already in business for a number of years and everyone was asking me like advice about how to start a business, how to do this properly, how to get funded. How do I take advantage of like all this COVID-19 relief? Like, what am I, what am I doing? Where am I going with this stuff? Um, so interestingly enough, because credit is very foundational because they had poor credit trying to start a business with no revenue or no proof of real concept, um, or just trying to have a side hustle, they either would have to leverage their credit, which they didn't have, or they would be in a position where they'd have to use themselves as personal guarantors in order to get like business lines of credit or things like that. And they didn't have that either. So it all came back full circle in a real like easy roundabout way where people were asking me for more business advice. So what I did with the book was I removed myself from the actual repair part. Um, I'm working right now on building a business addition to the converted book. So business owners or people who want to transition into becoming entrepreneurs have that foundational like understanding of how their personal credit is going to impact their business credit without revenue at first. And then um, also just a podcast, the book, like I'm also writing another book about um, just introductory business concepts that minorities need to know to position themselves well for funding and um, to be able to do things like government contracting, like bidding or no bidding or that kind of work. Um, and then also just other kind of like streamlining the process, speaking, of course, that's a, that's always a part of it, to make sure that it's all of those needs are addressed in a holistic sense. So I'm, that's a long roundabout way to say I moved away from the credit, but everything kind of always still comes back to it. And ultimately our, oops, sorry, ultimately our goal is to be able to be um, in a position to offer credit one day, you know, just to kind of like mm -hmm. really bring it home <laughs> to the roots wow. and, um, and, and essentially become a bank. Wow. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. That's the end goal is to be, build your own bank, a legitimate yeah. bank for business. That is yeah. for businesses. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, now, now, now we got to get into like, like, what, do, what do you think is your gift, right? Like there's something that, you know, is woven through all of this. You've mm -hmm. been able to, I mean, if I took a guess, I could guess, but I, I want to hear from you. What, yeah. what is, what is your gift? Um, you know, I think my strongest quality as far as like just being a business owner is being able to notice patterns and being able to understand trends and really looking at information um, like on the on a macro and micro level and see how things are going and how things are likely to pan out right I can't I'm not a psychic I'm not good I'm not I'm not saying I can predict the future but I haven't really been that wrong yet <laughs> so I think just looking at patterns and understanding um, things from like a mental physical behavioral sense um, I think, has helped me significantly. Like, our, like exa for example, like again, now I'm not a psychic. If we just pay attention to the patterns, life is very cyclical. Our society is cyclical. Our economy is cyclical. Our culture is cyclical. Things just keep coming back. When they come back is what was called to question or being able to see when it's kind of leaning and trending that way. For example, bell bottoms have come back. I'm 33 now. Bell bottoms have come back at least three times in my lifetime, right? So like they, they come back. Um, I've seen at least three or four recessions that I can remember. You know what I mean? Um, so if you can, if you pay attention and you see how these things are trending, I think that's one thing that people should learn how to do. But I think it's kind of almost innate. I don't, I don't, I didn't read any books about it. I didn't study it. I just read and I'm like, mm, that's interesting. Um, and I've been preaching about it since the beginning of the pandemic, like, hey, credit's changing and it's changed a lot. Um, right. You know, I said the housing market would change and it's changed a lot. Um, lending requirements, I'm going to go on record and now say they're going to become extremely stringent because as as government starts to tighten up spending, which they've already said they're pulling back on, right? Once they start to tighten up spending, that's that means for all that means for the consumer is whatever you think 
you're going to qualify for in the future is going to be more, is going to be a higher requirement. But I got that information from how they handled the 2008 recession, right? So just mm-hmm. pay attention, like really just look and see, hmm, I wonder how that's going to affect, affect us. And also what, what the motives are for the people who are making the decisions are, which is always monetary. So just kind of knowing that and understanding that will definitely impact how, Mm. or how I impact, how impacts how I move forward in my decisions and how I move as a business owner and what my strengths are. Have you always thought this way as a, even as like a child, like was this gift there from, and, and if you can take us back to, your earliest remembrance of seeing this kind of pattern. And it's kind of like you're uh, an economist, right? Like in a sense, <laughs> right? I mean, this is what I'm gathering. Um, I, truthfully, I don't understand an economist's job or their scope of work. But if that is the definition of one, then I guess it's kind of like maybe a sixth sense kind of thing. But I think it's a sixth sense. I, I really don't. I don't know what an economist does or their impact on society at large, I really don't know. So I can't I can't absorb that title or that that like that compliment fully. Yeah. But um yeah, I mean I just pay attention I'm a very observant person. I pay attention. I've always been very observant. Um like I wanna know what's going like even when I walk like into a church or building a large organization. I want to know where all the exits are. This is going to sound paranoid, but I'm not. Like, I want to know where all the exits are. I want to know, like, you know, is there a dress code? It's like, is there like a common thing that everyone agrees is a cult part of this, like, this insulated community, you know? Um, how people speak, how people are moving, how people are kind of engaging with one another. Um, very interesting. I find those things very interesting. And I think the same just kind of translate across business as well. Like, um, even as a kid, I could remember like looking at my mom and dad interact to see like who's right or wrong in the argument. <laughs> and then they'll turn around and ask me like, what do you think? And I'm just like, mm, you know, th- this or that or whatever the case may be. And they didn't think I'm paying attention for real, but th- like someone who um, was paying attention would only be able to give that kind of insight or input. So um, yeah, just observant. Just, I want to know. Very wow. interesting in knowing. Yeah. Well, I, I'd be remiss if I don't ask for, for the listeners' behalf. What else do you see coming in this financial um, season that were as upon us? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, both good and bad. Both good and bad. Um, to be honest with you, I see mostly bad in a way. Um, I think that um, we're going to have a big societal shift around money, for sure. Um, The conversations are going to keep shifting more towards digital as um, scamming becomes more of a problem, because that's a really big problem right now. Um, Even with some of the bank products that we're trying to develop, you know, I see how everybody's scared around it. Like, how are you going to security, security, security? So I think with, um, I think with such a big, risk of security people are people meaning like the economy and the government and organizations and major corporations are going to find ways to track us tighter so that there are better controls on who what's going where and who's doing what because banks are losing a lot of money because of this right um Mm -hmm. you have especially like vulnerable populations you have um elderly people who are being called and threatened to give up their bank account information or and or something's going to happen to their significant other, or they're being threatened and told that you know um, they owe fifty thousand dollars when they don't, and then someone wipes out their account. But who's held responsible for that, right? Um, and the bank is supposed to protect you. So in order to protect themselves, they're tightening up on some of those um, those uh, controls that they have. And mm-hmm. I think they think, from what I'm reading and what I'm seeing, I think they think that the solution to that is moving more towards like a digital framework. Um, and I think it's going to be an interesting transition because it isolates a large population, a large part of the population, um, like homeless people. It isolates elderly people. It isolates um, it isolates people who are living in like internet deserts now. Like they, those things still exist. So it's going to, oh yeah, for sure. So it's going to isolate a large group of people who already suffer from that. Um, it's If you don't already have your credit in order, it's definitely going to isolate you 
even further than it already does, like people who don't have um, foundational things like a bank account, because those those people still exist. Um, so I think it's going to harm them. So they're going to have a new problem to solve. And people who who know this could get ahead of it. Um, they could be solving that problem now and figuring out what how to solve it. But otherwise, like maybe start a corporation that even calls to help, but like they have to have security to combat the other security issues. Mm-hmm. Um so that's going to be interesting. And I, I think I see that coming down the pipeline and um, how it's going to pan out. I can't tell you, but I think it's going to, it's a definitely, that's one problem that we're going to have, especially like, and that ties into like the security and the moving to more of a digital currency mm. with our finances and how the economy is going. Um, definitely str- more stringent reti- requirements as far as lending is concerned. And um, when lending decisions are, being made, they're going to use more artificial intel, more artificial intelligence, like deeper learning on the human and the consumer um, to better understand how um, how to mitigate as much risk as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, because there is a lot of risk with with um, consumer lending right now. Still, being that like a lot of decision makers still there's still a human element to it and humans are inherently flawed and they believe that ai is the future for that um because it's it's they're less likely to make mistakes allegedly allegedly right but with that comes more data points which is why i think we're going to be um, monitored a lot more closely and they're going to um find ways to continue to pull data out of us because um predictive like algorithms are real. Like for example, if you have a poor credit score, um, they believe that like insurance car- ch- companies will charge you more because they believe that you're more likely to have an accident, but how would they have that information, right? So we're going to start seeing more of those things where um, we might be charged a premium if we have like mental health issues or maybe charge a premium if um, you're going through a divorce or like, like there's going to be like weird little nuanced things that don't seem like they make sense, but because of the AI machine learning, we're going to see um, the, the world kind of skew more towards that. So I think those are three things that I've just been watching to kind of see how they unfold, but it seems like they're leaning more and more t- towards that. And I, I just want to see how it's going to, how it's going to kind of happen. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. So how did you develop this, um, <clears throat> this gifting, like and develop yourself like what's the study that goes into uh making you you like what did you what did you do development wise are you reading are you studying are you analyzing it talk to this behind the scenes everybody because the success you've experienced i know there's an underneath that nobody saw yeah no for sure um i talk to myself a lot <laughs> Not in a like, you know, uh, like in an I answer kind of way. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. one more time. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm listening. Oh, sorry. No, I thought, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought you said something. Um, no, I, li- I talk to myself a lot, you know, in a not that I answer myself, but I, I like to go within and have conversations with um, myself and check myself a lot. I'm my, I'm my hardest critic, but also um, my softest place to land. Um, I'm also making sure that I'm competing against myself, um, as often as I can, you know, um, I understand my limitations. I know we, we think we're limitless, but there are things that I can't do. Um, I can do everything, but I can't do anything, right? No, I can do anything, but I can't do everything. And I check myself whenever I catch myself trying to do too much because I do too much sometimes. Um, (laughs) but, um, otherwise I, I learned how to, um, to think, just check myself about how I'm thinking and how I'm impacting others and um, think about the com- the impact that I want to make as a whole. And every time I'm not doing something that kind of is moving me towards that, then I just keep checking myself. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Wow. Okay. So really, really self-regulate and really you know, you're like you said, you're competing against yourself. Uh, I yeah. admire that. Um, <clears throat> so talk to us about marketing, right? Like, so we, we've kind of talked about the the three phases of one, discovering yourself, developing yourself. Um, how did you market yourself and market your business, market who you who you are? 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think it kind of goes back to the observation a little bit because I yeah. I think the best sellers are people who are who understand their consumer at a really deep level. So for anyone who might be interested in really learning how to close your close rate, <laughs> like tighten up your close rate, um, you have to really know what they want, address their needs on that like at the at the root of the problem, um, and then yeah. really yourself into how you can fix it. So just paying attention. I know what my consumers' issues are. My consumers don't want the um they don't want the hammer. They want the nail in the wall, right? So I'm mm-hmm. not trying to sell them on the tools. I, I have a book. They can read the book, but ultimately they want me to fix the problem for them. And I'm aware of that, right? Um mm-hmm. so I just try to make sure that I'm articulating, hey, this is the value, this is the cost, mm-hmm. and then this is what you're gonna get in exchange for that. Love it. Love it. So um, with the short time that we have left, um, tell us about your book and tell us about the resources that people can plug into to get connected and um, find out more about what you do. Yeah, sure. So um, the current book, the the existing book, the converted um book is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. So if anyone's interested in grabbing that, um, that will help you fix your personal credit needs, right? So um, it's a twofold process. There's a repair and then there's a rebuild. So if you do have any like derogatory marks, it'll show you how to actually read your report, um, what you need to know. It's not rocket science. It's very technical. The book is only 154 pages for both concepts, right? So straight to the point, um, I'm not giving you any fluff. You need to understand. You There are concepts that help you understand why it is that you're doing it just to kind of keep you motivated along the way. But um, it's enlightening, it's empowering, it's also resource rich. I wanted to make sure that there were actionable things that people can do today that they'd see results for in four to six months, because that's how long this time usually takes. Um, so that's that's that book. Um, the business edition will help entrepreneurs kind of frame that mm-hmm. entire experience, but then also priming their mind to move into entrepreneurship. And then um, the mental money book, the uh, manifesto for the min- aspiring minority mogul will be out early next year. And that book is just to help um, entrepreneurs just bulldoze through some of the obstacles that they would have to face on, when they can't afford someone like me to help them at the inception of their business and just avoid unnecessary mistakes. I love it. I love it. And what's the what's the what's the original book called? Converted. Converted. Uncovered strategies you need to easily achieve massive credit score success. Okay. We'll mm-hmm. make sure to plug that in um, the notes here. Um, a question I like to always wrap up an interview with mm-hmm. is: What's the difference between one's gift? and one's purpose, mm. one's gift and one's purpose? Um, I think the gift is what you are kind of born with. Um, I think the purpose is kind of what you decide to do with that gift for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. Clear. Clear as day. Clear as day. Yeah. <laughs> awesome, Natalie. Thank you for taking some time to connect and um, this valuable information. Um, where, where can people plug in with you? Is there a site that you want people to go to or resources? Yeah, yeah sure. So um, mentalmoneypodcast.com, um, mentalmoneypodcast.com, mentalmoneypodcast.com. Um, also, I'm Mental Money Pod on Twitter. I'm Mental Money Podcast on Instagram. I'm Mental Money. No, Mental Money. Me on Instagram. Money Mental Money Podcast on TikTok. Um, if you happen to jump on the site, we are. Um, if, or actually on the newsletter and the, the, all the links are somewhere on the, on the social media handles. Um, we give away a lot of resources for entrepreneurs. There's a lot of any new credit um, information that comes out. We, we share those as well. And um, we're also launching a $20,000 growth grant. So it would be great if um, people signed up for that. Um, and we also have supporting materials in case people don't know how to write proposals effectively so that they can increase their chances of winning grants, not just ours, but grants in um, in particular. Um, and yeah, just follow along. I'm always sharing insightful information, things that are useful. I don't really care to speak when I don't have anything important to say. So <laughs> just know if it's out there, it's important <laughs> to somebody. So um, that's that's pretty much that. Okay. Awesome, Natalie. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for the wisdom you've shared. Of course. You're a blessing. Keep doing great things. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.